If you've ever been to an official Rubik's Cube competition before, this is something you'll probably recognize. Yes! This, a stack mat timer display, is used to display the time shown on the timer connected to it so spectators can see what times competitors got in their average. Its purpose, and only purpose, is to display the result of the solve. And these things aren't cheap, they cost a lot more than you might think for what they do, but this is an official equipment all official WC competitions are required to use. And because of its price and simple purpose, other companies have started making their own displays for cheaper, though still expensive. But even then, there are minor problems like the displays not working because of battery issues Issues, which as you might imagine is really annoying. These displays have been used since the beginning of WC's history but we haven't seen any improvements in technology yet which is bizarre because displays are basically just decorations. But recently the WC has been introduced to a new timer display system which are not only cheaper but has many exciting features that could reshape how competitions are ran entirely in the future. This new system is called TimeBase. Created by Dan, Max Pastrashkov, and Calvin Nielsen, this new system was recently tested in an official Rubik's Cube competition for the first time ever on the 5th of November at Barry SPU Cubing 54. And I happened to go to this special competition where I met some pretty famous and well-known cubers such as Lars Petrus, the inventor of the Petrus method and one of the very few cubers who attended the 1982 Rubik's Cube World Championships, and Tyson Mao, the co-founder of the WCA. On the morning of this competition, Tyson actually did a ceremonial first official solve using time base. And now I think it's time to start explaining what time-based system actually does, so let's get into that. First of all, this display has the same functionality of that of a speed stacks display. You start and stop the timer, and the display will show the resulting time and the visible stopwatch on the front while the timer is running. But if you go back into inspection, you'll notice that there's a 15 second countdown in the front of the display, which is the first major feature they added. This is a button that judges can press when the competitor is ready, which acts as a stopwatch so there is no need for stopwatches. If the competitor goes over 15 seconds of inspection, the judge can apply those inspection penalties after the solve is finished. Speaking of penalties, now the result of a solve can be changed using the plus 2 and DNF button on the back of the display. The plus 2 penalties of the solve can be stacked, so by pressing the plus 2 button multiple times, you can stack penalty times onto the result. These buttons are also toggleable, which means that if you accidentally press the DNF button, you can press it again to remove the DNF status from the result. This also applies to the plus 2 button, where if you accidentally press the plus 2 button more than you need to, you can keep pressing the button until it reaches plus 16 before it cycles back to 0 again. Once the judge has inputted the correct penalties for the solve, they can press the OK button on the back of the display to sign for the solve, and then the competitor must tag their own NFC tags on the top of the display, which acts as the competitor's sign. Wait, what are NFC tags? Well, when competitors walk into a time-based competition, they of course need to pick up their name tags. But in these name tags that time-based competitions give out is an NFC chip which interacts with the display and some other things which I'll talk about later. And when you go up to submit your puzzle to compete, you'll find an empty cube cover and then put your cube and your name tag in it. Then, once your cube is scrambled, the cube and your name tag will be brought to an open solving station where the runner will tap the name tag on the top of the display. This is to let the display know which competitor they're recording the result for. And once the competitor tags their name tag on the display after their solve, the result will immediately go up on WC Live, as demonstrated from the ceremonial first solve with Tyson Mao. So before we scan this tag, uh, everyone wants to open WC Live right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, we're gonna Tyson scan it and want you to see how fast it gets up. It was under 20. <laughs> and it should be up. This new technology allows for new features on WC Alive. For example, after you finish your fourth solve on your average, WC Alive will actually show you your best possible and worst possible average next to your name and the list of results. These modified name tags also have a role during scrambling too. When submitted cubes are brought to the scrambling station, the scrambler scans the competitor's name tag on a reader connected to a computer, after which the computer screen will show only the scramble that the competitor is supposed to receive for their next solve. This prevents misscrambles because scramblers often apply the wrong scramble on a cube because the computer screens normally show all 5 scrambles. Speaking of preventing incidents like misscrambles, the time-based display is also reset-proof, meaning that even if the timer resets or if the timer gets unplugged from the display, the last result will still show on the display until the solve is signed and submitted. Not to mention, it also allows for the timers to go over 10 minutes, because usually timers turn off after 10 minutes have passed, but now even if that happens, the display will continue to time the solve until it is finished, when the judge can manually stop the timer using the buttons on the display. This allows competitors to be able to 
to use regular timers instead of stopwatches on long events like multi-blind, five-blind, four-blind, and sometimes even three-blind. Also, if incidents were to happen, the judge can now press the delegate button on the back of the display. What this does is that it sends a notification on the delegate's smartphone so that it can come over to the station to resolve the incident manually, or resolve it remotely using the time-based app that delegates have access to. And with that, I think I've covered most of the important systems in time-based. But is this system actually practical to switch to? Sure, all of these systems are incredibly useful and makes competitions run faster, but it doesn't really help if 80% of the system malfunctions in competition, does it? So how did it go on Bay Area Speed Cubing 54, the first competition to ever test run time base? First of all, to even prevent confusion and mistakes in the first place, this competition does a good job of preparing the competitors before using time base. Having extreme preparation systems like having 13 delegates and the 85 minute debrief and tutorial, which happened before the competition even started. Just to show how insane that is, normally competitor tutorials last around 30 minutes at most, and Western Championships 2023 also had 13 delegates managing the competition. Western Championships had the same amount of delegates as a local competition with three events. That probably prevented this competition from spiraling out of control, and I think it was definitely worth it. Throughout the competition, most of the system worked as they were supposed to, but even then, there were many problems that involved human errors, system errors, and many other problems that I'm not aware of. For example, the new 3x3 world record single of 0.2 seconds that actually was probably just a timer malfunction that got handled incorrectly. And during 3x3 round 1 when I was judging, I accidentally signed for a solve that was supposed to have a plus 2 penalty applied to it. And since I already pressed OK for it, I couldn't edit the time for it to have a penalty. And remember how I said earlier that delegates can solve this problem using their smartphone? Yeah, apparently. But for this case, Kelvin actually had to bring out a computer to manually fix the times using code. Sorry about that, Kelvin. Now, these are all preventable mistakes which can be fixed with proper competitor tutorials or just by being careful and aware of what you're doing. But there are some inevitable systematic errors too. For example, during this competition on the second round of 3x3, the group I was in, group 2, was called in for our first solves. But after we were done with our first solve, the delegates found out that they had accidentally used the wrong scramble set that was supposed to be used for group 3. We ended up waiting around around 20 minutes for them to generate new scrambles for the next group, and when the solves came back, I bombed my average. But I think these systematic problems were a big problem because we were following very strict guidelines for this competition that caused us to panic when something went wrong because we didn't know what to do. But if we continue to use this system, experiment, and fix bugs, we'll start to get more flexible with how we manage these problems, and because this system is so technical, these things may not even be a real issue in the future. Even if the smaller issues scare some people, in my opinion, it's not as bad as you might think. We have similar issues with the traditional system already, like having messy handwriting or switching cubes around by accident. Wait, this isn't my cube. But we've been running competitions like that for so long that it's barely a problem anymore, and I believe the same thing can happen to time base if we keep using that too. But either way, if we get used to this system, that means we will have a system with equal or less problems compared to the traditional system because of continued experimentation. Even if this system is beneficial, we still don't know where this technology may go. I know I look like a copycat when I say this, but we can compare how much growth time base will show with a thing called the sigmoid curve, a mathematical function often used to describe a new technology's rate of growth and improvement. If time base fixes its bugs and malfunctions like the one I mentioned before, this technology could continue to spread in WCA competitions and could be implemented in more places, and in the future, maybe even major competitions. However, if we consider the alternate path of a sigmoid curve, the decline phase, this could also apply to time base if it can't catch up with the WCA's expectations or if it doesn't have the support from the community. But based on past competitions with time base and a poll I did a while back, I think it's safe to say that the technology has the support of many people in the cubing community, although I can kind of understand why people are skeptical of this technology. So to wrap this video up, I'll finish by saying that I believe time base will be a game changer for competitions if we keep using this in competition and fixing bugs along the way. If we manage to eliminate most of the major issues that come with time base, like the one I mentioned in this video, more and more people will find it beneficial to use and more and more competitions will start to use time base as well, at least in the western coast. So far, there has been a total of 5 competitions that has used or partially used time base, and there are many more upcoming competitions that plan to use it. A comment from Timebase's release forum post on WCA said that they had talked to Calvin Nielsen about the spread of this technology. It wrote that he reckoned that it will take about 5 years to have most competitions utilize time base. Of course, it may take longer. This video was mostly to show the cubing community what this technology is and trying to tell more people that it exists. Even though most of this video was based on personal opinions, I made it anyways because I personally think this technology is awesome, and I am excited to see more from Timebase. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and thanks for watching.